stuff that's street smart. It's about being school smart and adopting and embracing a lot of things that are street smart. He did, I mean, I'm just going to list out three things. One, he got mentored by a quasi not smart dude. I want to say, you know, politically incorrect. But he got mentored by a person who's really good at sales. His name's Rudy. Didn't finish high school, okay? Sales manager at Pier Chain. And he got mentored to go sell. And it was really hard for him because he used to work at Argonne National Lab. Anybody ever heard of Argonne National Lab? It's supposed to be a great job if you're, uh, you know, Emmy. Um, so he did that. <laughs> and then the faster he, and then every day coming home from high school, he'd always say, oh my God, Larry, I wish I would have started my business earlier. I really wish I would have started my business earlier. He was like in his 50s. And so when I quit engineering, it's like, literally, literally, why'd you quit engineering? <laughs> After hearing him come home and say, I wish I would have quit being an engineer earlier, and that's the transition that I made. So he did a bunch of other things that were street smart. He was the one who actually turned me on to Mark McCormack's book, okay? And my father, and this is what he won't teach you, but I will, he's the fourth brother, so he's able to coattail really well. Does anybody here have a younger brother or a younger sibler, sibler, sibling that would coattail a little bit? Okay, so a lot of people also in the NBA, they have siblings that are much older than they are. So he's a huge coattail, okay? I am my father's son, okay? I coattail everything. Absolutely drag. Who's seen um, Talladega Nights? Ricky Bobby would win races, how? By coattailing his like buddy. He would like slingshot engage, right? Shake and bake. Shake and bake. Shake and bake. <laughs> so coattailing is huge. And I'm going to coattail my. MVP mentor, thank you for bringing up Pablo, Eric Ries, okay, Eric Ries comes up with this awesome thing, it's called Minimum Viable Product. If you guys aren't familiar with it, read about it, Minimum Viable Product. It gets your product out the door, not worrying if it's perfect or not, and then it gets customer feedback right away. Well, I coattailed him by having something called Minimum Viable Party, because I believe that people are just thankful for a 15 minute party. You don't have to do a two-hour party with open bar. You don't have to do a, 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 a legendary event. People are just happy with a theme in uh, a hotel bar. And maybe an Eventbrite. You know what? Let's say Eventbrite's too big of a commitment. Do a plan cast. Has anybody ever heard of plan cast or who hasn't? Ten people push towards one direction is a party. Now, it's critically important for us as engineers, okay, to host things. Because the faster we can go from guest to host, the better that we will do in our careers. I have a bunch of people in my family that went to really good schools. I have one in particular, an uncle who's socially awkward, okay? Extremely socially awkward. He's a guest even at his own party. Do you see what I'm saying? He doesn't host you, he doesn't like make you feel comfortable. And the faster that we can make the transition from being a guest at a party to hosting and producing and promoting, I argue that the better that we'll do as entrepreneurs. So my father would host stuff for Tai Da, a school in Taiwan, and he hosts things for uh, alumni group meetups. So it helps the host. And I love the minimum viable party concept idea. Does anybody feel pushback on that so far? Or you want me to just keep on rolling through? Now, Taking minimum viable party, you can actually speak at a conference that you're barely invited to. Damien, thank you for bringing that up. Speaking overweights a person's significance, okay? Like, take me. I'm probably going to be your least qualified speaker. I'm not, I'm not doing worse financially, but I'm definitely one of, I mean, you do the spectrum of speakers, okay? I'm in the bell curve part at the 90th percentile if you're counting from one to the bottom. But that's okay. But you, as, as people that are academically qualified, okay, so, I mean, I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I mean, who, had, who had this school as their backup choice to go? Probably not that many, right? Now, take that in the working world, okay? In the working world, you're going to be fourth, fifth, or maybe 15th down the list. How are you going to be in dealing and handling failure? Chapter 11, okay, my favorite book, is how to handle failure in dealing with difficulty. It has nothing to do with, I mean, you, you guys all know, it has nothing to do with how smart you are, 
it has a bunch of other soft factors. I think the number one factor is how we deal with failure. And we're going to be failing when we try to do this. Speak at a conference that you are not invited to. I have this theory that at a conference or at an event, there's 650 little things to do. Okay, 650 little things that we, as the conference promoter or the conference producer, need to do. Dan knows because he's doing, uh, SSC Labs is now doing uh, Venture Beat Going Green, and now Summit at Stanford, both significant multi-thousand dollar conferences where the undergrads get to make that money. There's 650 little things to do. An event is made awesome mathematically if you do 400 to 450 things. It's impossible to do all 650 little things. Now, I argue that with that little gap, you should do 15 to 30 things when you're doing my maneuver called value added conference crasher. You want to write that down because that phrase is worth a bunch of ROI. Because you're going to be on teams in the future where you will not be invited to the conference. Okay? You're going to be jumping from analyst to associate after spending a couple hundred grand. Okay? And you're going to be the fifth or sixth guy in that deal team who may not be invited to that conference. I argue that you should be speaking at a similar conference that you are not invited to by doing a fireside chat where you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview. A fireside chat where you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview. So you're trying to bring a person that maybe the conference themselves were not able to, to get or corral, but because you're willing to call an email once or twice every other day, you're able to corral and wrangle a speaker. And what you're trying to do here is you're not necessarily needing to speak as an expert, but you can definitely interview it as an expert, where you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview. I did a similar thing with Tim Draper, who's actually going to be your speaker tomorrow, for an event for Stanford Entrepreneur Week, where you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview and you get credit for speaking, but you're actually just doing an interview. The other thing to do before this, speak at a conference that you were not invited to, is you want to blog. Starting your own blog is a huge responsibility. Does everybody agree with that? Starting your own blog, you got to blog twice a month, kind of hard. But nobody's ever talked about guest blogging. You can guest blog on my blog. I mean, granted, you know, I'm going to be pushing my number of readers from 18 to, to 30 because you guys are all be like, oh, I just published this blog post. Guest posting, okay, is an awesome, awesome, awesome hack because you're able to publish and then you're able to build your. Uh, who wanted to write the book? What was your name? Rob. Rob. So it's a great way to collect articles. It's a great way to collect articles to write a book. Does anybody blog or part-time blog? Does anybody plan on blogging this event? What's the name of the pizza restaurant? Is it Upper Crust? Uh, tonight? Yeah. yeah. So I will be giving a $100 gift card to whoever blogs this event to Upper Crust. Is that dirty of me to do? It's not for a $100 gift card. So if you do blog it, and this is a blog requirement. Three paragraphs, 12 sentences, two pictures, one focus. Has anybody ever read one of my blog articles? Wow, two readers, one. That's okay. Because guess what? It only took me an hour to write those five bullet points on what it is that a supermodel can teach a Stanford MBA about blank. Okay. <coughs> taking one hour to crank it out. Let me repeat that. It's 12 sentences, three paragraphs, two pictures, one focus. And the two pictures you can just use from last year's event. That's a minimum viable blog post. Should take you about an hour. Does anybody have any questions about speaking at a conference that you were not invited to? The other way to woo a speaker, okay, is if that guy's got a book that they're promoting, 10, 15, 20 copies of that book purchased tugs his leash a decent amount. And by tugging that leash, I mean, hey, Tim Draper, I just bought 20 copies of Bill Draper's book. It'd be great if you could speak at my thing tomorrow. And then tugging on that leash and getting that person's attention. Because the other thing that I've noticed, you had a question? Great point. Great point, great point, great point. I love how all these things break down in the tactical, okay? Kind of a high idea, kind of a low idea, kind of a dirty idea, okay? But this is actually how to, to make it uber clean. So, you initially do it in evening programming, okay? First night 
uh, 7 o'clock. Nobody's going to do evening programming at 7 o'clock. At South by Southwest, okay, I moved it all the way back to midnight plus one minute because I was assuming that nobody would book a speaker at midnight, right? Right? So what you do is you initially book them for the evening, okay? You can even have an invited slash placeholder speaker. And your goal with this is to try to migrate and become more legitimate, okay? And in the evening, you're just augmented content, okay? You can SEO it really high, search engine optimize it really highly by putting it on Eventbrite, by tweeting it, and by blogging about it. And if somebody else blogs about it, you will actually SEO higher than some conference events uh, themselves. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the maneuver of being a value-added crasher, and you're trying to make the maneuver of, oh my gosh, um, is it John? Justin. Justin, sorry. Did I call you John twice now, right? Um, where, where, where you want to migrate to being legit. You want to migrate yourself from being illegitimate to legitimate. And the way to do that is by having a speaker, oh my gosh, I didn't know that we could get that person. Okay? Or if it's conjoined or something in the environment that makes him near. The reason Tim Draper's speaking tomorrow, okay, mathematically, is much more likely to be speaking here because he will be here later on in the day for Venture Capital 65, which Xconomy is doing, which I also blog at. So what happens is you're looking at the environment and you're saying, okay, who else can I woo that's already going to be in town? And so you actually might now become legitimate because you have a decent evening speaker that you might be able to wrangle in for 5 o'clock because speakers and stuff shifts all the time. And that's another huge hack, okay, that I've noticed in schools that are awesome academically is that people do not get comfortable being on the wait list. Did anybody come? Okay, don't raise your hands there. But did anybody get into this school, okay, from the wait list? I can name legendary Silicon Valley Tony. <laughs> oh, me, Larry. Well, actually, no. I can name legendary Silicon Valley thought leaders, okay, that came in off the wait list. If you want a Rolodex, if you think I'm scandalous, okay, I boil down other people's scandalous maneuvers and stuff that they've done, okay. Working the wait list, okay? Working the wait list, huge. Working the wait list is huge. And this is what you're doing. You're combining the, the value-added crasher with the wait list, and you might actually migrate up to morning keynote or morning fireside chat. Does that sound like it's kind of dirty? Does that sound not doable? What happens is you're going to be fourth or fifth if you're corporate. You're going to be fourth or fifth, okay? You're going to be on the cusp of going to the conference or not going to the conference. And these types of things get you to build your, your Rolodex while a company's paying for your guys' subscription fee for your guys' conference. Is anybody getting, getting value out of this? Anybody loving it? Anybody hating it? Can you talk a little more about working the waitlist? Sure, 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 sure. There's this gambit, okay? It's called Second Supplier Gambit. Second Supplier Gambit. It's killer. My, the theory behind it is if you are number two on enough lists, eventually you'll be number one on a good majority of them. And what happens, for some reason, if you go get in a really, really, really good school, you over-extrapolate how little you're going to have to be on the waiting list in life. Which is why if you look at a lot of awesome <coughs> law firms, they're all filled with you know, Harvard Law, but the guy who started it, some night school, fly-by-night, managing director founder who just was a hungry dog and he just absolutely worked it like a community college person. So the idea of these things and the whole reason I thought about naming it the Tom Chang Engineer to Entrepreneur Transformation is that the people that are in my father's family that tend to do better are able to kind of set aside how well they did in school and start doing all this street smart stuff of, of waitlisting themselves. As far as a particular idea for waitlisting, um, anything from speaking, so whatever hard, difficult thing that you think is three levels above you that you can do if you waitlist and produce similar content. Similar content here. Should we jump into how to get media or do we want to do have text message questions? Got a couple. 
so I'll address some of those. How do we get media? First thing I want to try to do is I want to try to ex establish myself as an expert resource for bloggers. Okay, I want to try to get a targeted hit list of bloggers, okay? And I want to be the second supplier. I want to be the primary expert that that blogger then looks to or facilitates. And I want to constantly tickle that blogger with new information based on his previous articles. Hopefully that will be geared towards my industry or my focus, but it does not necessarily have to be that, okay? That's a great way to build and to, to tuck, tug on the leash of a blogger. Also, Mike Arrington, who I, where I also blog at, at TechCrunch, he talks about actually wanting to be yanked. His, he actually talks about how to manage him as a blogger, which is walk me, walk me, walk me, and when there's something important, yank on my chain really, really hard. And what he's trying to say by that is he wants to get ideas and leads for media. Okay. Now, so Douglas had the question of how do I promote at a conference? Celebrities work, okay? Quasi-celebrities work. Um, coinciding your media story with a existing uh, statistic that the government announces is a huge hack because all stories need a visual and local component to it. So a huge hack is when the government announces some Bureau of Labor Statistics of Employment's up or down 2% related to your, your particular uh, startup story, and especially if you've got a live event. If you're doing a live event, get a photographer and do five to ten pictures. Who else has questions about how to get media? Because it feels as if I'm just glossing it over versus tactically going over it. The other observation I made is people that are, I'll get, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just something I wanted to bring up. There's also this great resource online called Help a Reporter Online. Stephen's company. Yeah, so uh, basically, reporters come in and they say they need sources for, um, I don't know, like B cards or BC, and then you go in as an expert and say, I can provide uh, an expert opinion. And it's all about board. 